we'll, we'll get started in just a few minutes. Hello, everyone. Hi, Nick. Hey, how are you? I am great. I'm great. We'll give a few more people a chance to sign in. We see lots of people joining us this evening. Okay, well, we're going to go ahead and get started. It's right at 7 o'clock, and we're excited to have people join us this evening. Good evening, everyone. My name is Wanda Willis, and I am the Director of Community Engagement and Social Responsibility for the Comer Museum of Art and Gardens. Thank you all so much for joining us for this evening's Cultural and Conversation, Responding to the Current Events Through the Arts. This is the second of our Culture and Conversation series, which we hope cultivates meaningful dialogue and makes connections to the arts, the gardens, and to one another. <coughs> First of all, I would like to take a moment to thank our very generous sponsors, Matt and Ashley Woditz, for this evening's event. Ashley is a member of the Comer Board of Trustees and a very strong supporter of the arts in our community. Today, as everyone knows, has been quite an exciting day at the Comer Museum. Earlier today, we announced that after an extensive national search, the Comer Museum will be welcoming Dr. Andrea Barnwell Brownlee as the institution's next George W. and Kathleen I. Gibbs Director and Chief Executive Officer. Andrea is a good friend of Nick's and we're happy to have her join us on this Zoom tonight. Hi, Andrea. Nick, you want to say hi? Hey, Andrea. Congratulations. <laughs> Great. Great. We're so excited that you're joining us on this call this evening, and we certainly look forward to you joining us at the Comer. If anyone would like to learn more information about Dr. Brownlee, please feel free to visit our website at comermuseum.org. But at this time, let's get started for what we're all here for. We are so pleased this evening to have the opportunity to have an intimate conversation with Nick Cave, an American fabric sculptor, dancer, and performance artist. Throughout history, artists have used their art forms to amplify conversations surrounding injustices that have shaped our country and our world. So here we are, Nick, let's get the conversation started. So you were born in Fulton, Missouri in fairly a large family, would you say? Tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I was raised uh, with seven siblings, all boys, uh, and a amazing mother. Uh, my father passed when I was uh, 16. Uh, and so, you know, it was, and my mother comes from a family of 16. So, you know, it was amazing in terms of just the sort of the unconditional sort of love and the support that I and my brothers sort of received growing up. You know, we were just sort of raised and taught to be caring and loving people. Um, and the arts have always been part of my sort of practice. So I've been sort of surrounded by that, quilt makers, uh, wood makers. And so the, the whole idea of, of art and, and seeing it as a, um, as really, I think, for the most part, as a, uh, as a craft, as a, uh, task or a sort of after work kind of activity, you know, was really part of my sort of existence. And my aunts were amazing seamstresses. And so, you know, not that I was doing any of that, but I would be looking over my shoulders at that activity and was curious enough about it that it sort of stuck with me. And, um, 
but in school, I was certainly in on the arts club and, and sort of in the art sort of sort of world and thinking about art and 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 dance at that particular time. So, you know, it was great. My brothers are great. Um, you know, they uh, we talk all the time. Um, Jack, who's the oldest, is also an artist who's also a professor at the School of the Art Institute here in Chicago, where I, I also teach. Um, and so, you know, I've always been sort of in that kind of world. And, you know, I think for me, I think I've just been sort of this individual that's always been sort of conditioned and then handed off to the next a uh, person meaning like teachers that would sort of help shape um, me into existence uh, for the most part. Do you have a teacher who probably made maybe the most impact on you as a kid? Oh yeah, Miss Mickret, uh, my high school uh, teacher who really sort of said to me that, you know, you should look at maybe considering um, art school, which I didn't know, like, what does that mean? I thought that was all sort of connected to a university. But, you know, she was thinking more about um, an art school that was more sort of uh, focused in uh, art and uh, humanities. And so I uh, applied to the Kansas City Art Institute and did my undergraduate there. And then uh, went on to get my master's at Cranbrook Academy of Art outside of Detroit. As a kid, did you sort of think that you would become an artist one day? Was that something that you could sort of see as a vision of that you could actually be an artist? You know, as a kid, you know, I think I knew that I was going to be doing something in the arts. And I think it was because I saw Michael Jackson. I saw the Jacksons and I- okay, so now Tell me how Michael Jackson fits into the arts. Oh, the Jacksons. I love Michael Jackson, so. On, on TV for the first time and I knew, I don't know. I just told my mother, I'm gonna be like that. And I didn't, not that I was thinking like musician or, or, or mm -hmm you know, working in the performing arts, but I knew that I was interested in that as a way of being. I don't know what that meant in terms of, you know, I wasn't thinking as a kid, a way of being. I just knew that I could identify with sure. talent and, and uh, what I was sort of being sort of uh, encountering. So, and you know, that's really interesting because as a kid, sometimes, you know, many young kids don't really get to sort of see anyone who inspires them to sort of grow up to, to even know that they can be this or they can be that. So that, that's pretty incredible that Michael Jackson had that kind of and my effect mother, on you. And my mother did too. Because as a kid, I would make all of her holiday cards, all of them. And so I think just the sort of the expression and the sort of awe that she sort of delivered to me when she would receive these handmade cards was like everything to me. I didn't understand like this small thing, thing could be so impactful to someone. So I was just sort of fascinated by the delivery of this object and the impact that it would have on her as she showed her uh, gratitude and, and um, uh, response. So, you know, that has, that has really stuck with me in terms of my delivery today in my work, how I sort of, what I expect it to do in the world, so. It's based wow. off of that experience. So when you would make those cards, so uh, what kind of objects would you use? Would you just find things around the house or did you have certain yeah. um, 
it was some stuff around the house. It was, you know, through painting, through, you know, sort of collage, whatever means that I, necessary that I had access to is really sort of how I would go about it. So it was not that anything was off the table. Um, but I think it's really just the effort and, and the sort of commitment that I sort of put into uh, uh, creating that is was really and is probably the most sort of important sort of factor. Sure, I'm, I'm sure if your mom was like any other mom, she's probably had saved many of those cards oh that you made. Oh my God, yes, she had <laughs> and everything else. <laughs> That's what moms do, right? They just sort of save everything. So, so what what inspires you most as an artist? What inspires me the most as an artist is really uh, just that I can be a catalyst. Uh, to sort of talk about uh, what is currently going on in, in the world. I think art has always mirrored that. And so for me, the exciting thing is, is being able to do that, being able to put it out in the world, to, to be able to work in community, uh, because it's really not for me, it's for everyone else. And so I'm just the messenger to deliver the deed. That's, I understand that. <laughs> so it, it seems like much of your art has been sort of skillfully building sort of a language of symbolism and ritual and, and your um, recently exhibition in uh, Bentonville, Arkansas. Tell us a little bit about the process leading up to, to that project. Well, you know, that project titled Until uh, was a project that actually started in at Mass MoCA, uh, the Museum of Contemporary Art in Massachusetts. And so Denise Marconish, who's the curator there, uh, came to my studio in 2015 uh, and invited me to do this project there. She said, I'm going to give you Gallery 5, which is like the size of a small football field. Wow, that's pretty big. <laughs> that massive. And only one stipulation, I do not want you to do any sound suits. And I said, perfect. And, uh, and so she said, I'm going to go away for a year and come back and uh, uh, meet with you and see what you've uh, come up with. Prior to of uh, that time, you know, I was working in the studio on other projects, really wasn't really thinking about Mass Mocha that much. Uh, but then in 20, somewhere in 2015, uh, Freddie Gray happened. And that turned everything upside down and also made it very clear what I needed to do at Mass Mocha. And so uh, as I was working in the studio, I was sitting there and I was just, uh, this thought came to mind, is there racism in heaven? And so that was the catalyst for the project Until. And so Until is this sort of kinetic, uh, installation that really puts you into the belly of a sound suit. So it's really sort of uh, sort of exposing really what really drives me and what really gets me sort of uh, in this sort of position to take a stance around racism and just and police brutality. And so you walk into this vast space where there are thousands and thousands of wind spinners spinning in the space. Uh, and so you find that you're sort of moving through this kinetic forest. Uh, the wind spinners are 
You know, off the shelves, uh, pretty wind spinners, but also mixed within the spinners or custom ones, which are then guns and bullets and teardrops and targets. And so you are mesmerized by the first sort of impact of this experience until you get close and then you're just burdened with this other imagery that is literally has you sort of confused and sort of torn between beauty and sort of sort of the sort of repression of reality and i chose the wind spinners because you know it's interesting how we as a society feel that it doesn't pertain to us and yet it's right in our backyards and so that was the choice of using that particular object so as you move through this um uh, kinetic sort of uh forest you will come to this crystal cloudscape and that crystal cloudscape is this object that hovers above your head this massive object underneath it's all made of crystals uh, and then above you, which you get to climb up to the top on these sort of ladders, you will find yourself in this enchanting uh, forbidden garden. And existing in the gardens are about 20 iron lawn jockeys that are sort of uh, moving about and, and holding these dream catchers. Uh, and so it was me sort of thinking about, you know, I'm always interested in sort of reclaiming, re sort of imagining uh, these sort of repressive objects that are out here in the world that are blatantly sort of uh, really sort of uh, talking about uh, racism. Uh, and so in re reimagining those and given, giving them a new sort of uh, way of being. Uh, and so they're holding these dream catchers living within this extraordinary sort of landscape. And so within all of this work, although it's burdened with uh, ideas of, of oppression, it's also generating a new life. Uh, opt optimism, hope. So how does that, um, I, I think you're a, a little bit ahead of your time. I, it, it seems like that type of political unrest and racial unrest is very similar to what we're going through at this particular time here in 2020. So how do you see that sort of relating um, to where we are right now in the moment? where we are right you know, now. I think, you know, I've been sort of dealing with this issue for three decades. Uh, but, but what's interesting is, uh, you know, since George Floyd, there has been uh, Jonathan Price uh, uh, that was just killed by an un unarmed Black uh, individual that was just killed by a police. Um, and so it's interesting because I'm also working on a new project uh, uh, with an exhibition coming up next year. And it was really sort of me imagining like Sound Suits 2.0, imagining what would that look like today. Behind me is just a glimpse of the beginning of that body of work. Uh, but since George Floyd, all of what is behind me will be uh, shrined in a black veil of sorts. So all of this color and pattern once again will be in mourning. Um, and so that's the sort of interesting thing about you know, my work right now and is that uh, depending on what's going on in the world, how it can alter and shift how I may want it to be as opposed to how I'm feeling. Um, 
But then at the same time, I'm doing projects that are public-based projects that are, are about action, urgency, and really asking myself, how do I become part of the fabric and really sort of asking myself about purpose. How is my purpose being effective in the world? And what can I do to help shape the way in which I want the future to look like? And so it all comes down to responsibility and really sort of, you know, I live in this amazing building here in Chicago. I have these amazing storefront windows. You know, I was in, in Columbia, Missouri when George Floyd happened, visiting my mother. And the overwhelming sort of feeling of I have to get back because I have to get to work was so enormous that I had to leave my my visitation with my mother earlier uh, in order to get back and get to work. And getting to work was asking myself, how do I ask the community to talk about racism? And so me and my partner, Bob Faust, uh, really uh, took on that project, which was called Amends. We asked about 50 of our closest friends and supporters to come and write letters to the world about racism on the front of the windows. We then uh, went across the street and worked with the public school, which had this amazing lawn on the front. We asked them if we could use the lawn and create a clothes line where we could invite the city of Chicago to come and write their amends on yellow tape and then tie them to the clothes line. Uh, and so over 900 people came and did that exercise. And so that remained up for about two and a half months. Uh, we just recently took that down. We then wrote all of the amends that were on the clothesline. We then gave that text and the letters to the world to a spoken word artist here in Chicago that will then create another work from uh, all that, all the text pieces. So again, just sort of putting the project, you know, into the hands of others that again, keeps this conversation going. It's all about conversation. It's all about, you know, how do we, you know, you know, what are our responsibilities um, outside of our own sort of way of existing to help sort of, uh, eradicate racism. I certainly think that um, the world of art and some of your pieces have really, really ignited some conversation around racism. And certainly the George Floyd uh, murder has really opened up to the world the opportunity to really face um, racism, which has been here all along. Mm -hmm. um, but it allows us the opportunity to have some conversation and really, really just sort of dig, you know, take a deeper dive into what we believe and how people react to certain things. But what I'd like to ask you is, your work does open up the opportunity for conversation around racism. When you are creating a piece, do you feel some type of healing? I know that art can sometimes provide a, a healing place as we're all going through the I would say just the exhaustion of, of racism that you know we have dealt with for years and years and years, but now we're at the forefront of being able to openly have dialogue. Do you find some sense of peace or healing in, as you are creating your works of art? Well, I'm certainly aware that you know this platform, this studio space, 
this sacred sort of space allows, has been my um, savior. I must say that. Uh, but, you know, I have my moments where I am dealing with emotional fatigue. I mean, I did not understand. I was wondering, like, why am I not happy? You know, prior to George Floyd, I, you know, up and down, like trying to sort of put a understanding to it. But then when George Floyd happened, it that feeling that I had been feeling all along came very clear. And I think for me, as well as probably many uh, people of color, is that we departmentalize these emotions mm -hmm. in order to navigate and sort of function in the world. But when George Floyd happened, I finally understood that emotion. And it all came real clear. And so, but you know, my studio, studio has always been this sort of space where I can just pour it all out and put it all in the work. And I put it all in the work. Um, it's hard, it's painful, but it has purpose. You know, I have been chosen, as I said, to deliver these deeds and art has, has always been the vehicle for me for change. And so I've always been sort of uh, graciously uh, blessed with this sort of platform and uh, do not take it for granted. Well, that is definitely a blessing to be able to pour your energy into that. Um, I would love to have more conversation around in, in different cities around the country with some of your artwork to allow other people to be able to have those open conversations about racism, things that totally exhaust you on a daily basis. And uh, it's, it's pretty amazing to be able to have an outlet. Um, tell me a little bit more um, about the sound suits. I mean, that's when I became more familiar with your work and I just think they're fabulous. You know, they're colorful and, and playful, but I know that there's a much deeper meaning uh, surrounding the sound suits. And just tell us a little bit more about uh, oh, that work of art. Yeah, you know, the original sound suit started with the Rodney King incident. Uh, and really what I was thinking was really trying to find a way to conceal my emotions, my identity, you know, trying to create a, uh, some sort of suit of armor of, of sorts um, in order for me to function. You know, how can I, what can I do to sort of just to protect my inner sort of self and my spirit. And so, you know, it came out of the Rodney King and yet, you know, it, as I was, I was in the park one day here in Chicago and, um, you know, really trying to process that, you know, that was the first time we were able to see a recording of an incident. So, you know, it changed everything for everyone. And so uh, I was sitting in the park and I was just trying to sort of process that and uh, look down and there was this twig on the ground. And for some reason, I just started collecting all of the twigs in the park. Went back home, got a shopping cart, came back and with a trash bag and just filled the entire trash bag with twigs, went back to my studio, started to build this object, did not think that I could put it on. I don't know what I was thinking. I just knew that I had to build this second skin. Realized that I could put it on. The moment that I put it on and started to move, it made sound. And so that's how Sound Suit came about. And making sound led me 
to this place of protest. And in order to be heard, you got to speak louder. So, you know, and yet it was protecting me. It was hiding my gender identity class. And so it was forcing the viewer to be confronted with something other. And how do we come to something other without judgment? And so that was the beginning of this series of sounds that were, again, made from nothing and yet uh, made this sort of extraordinary sort of object that was, was overwhelming for me, was exciting for me, but I wasn't quite ready for that body of work just quite yet. So I did probably 10 sound suits, but then I kept them like in the closet because I, I could make it, but I wasn't mentally there yet to sort of take on the responsibility that I, I knew that it would change my life when I made the first one. I knew that my life would be different the moment I put it in the world. But I had to sort of mentally get myself there in order for the, that um, delivery to happen. So it took a minute. So how did you feel that your life would change? I just knew that what I had made didn't exist in the world of art. I knew it was something, I knew that it was a wedge in the pie that I had created. And so I could just feel it. It's not, you know, it's just a feeling. And so, you know, I got stronger and got bigger in myself. And, you know, when I did uh, premiere this body of work, like, overnight my life did change and so that was sort of the beginning of my career. So how long did it take you to make the first one? It took me probably uh, I would say probably a week of you know maybe 14 hour days every day so when you're creating something like that, do you have someone that you sort of um, share that with to get their thoughts or is just the creative mind just working 14 hours a day and then voila, you've got this great piece of work? Yeah, never share any ideas with anyone. <laughs> I just sort of, I don't really draw a sound suit. I just make it. I have this idea in my head. And, for me, it's like, I can't realize it in a drawing. I have to actually make it in order for it to sort of have life and for me to realize and imagine is it everything that I imagined it to be. And so, and that really comes through just making and watching it develop and come to fruition in the moment and and, you know, it's never perfect and nothing is ever perfect. And so I'm open to imperfection blemishes and, and yet through that still able to arrive to this extraordinary place of beauty and otherness. So the piece behind you, tell me about that. <laughs> <laughs> it's gorgeous, by the way. <laughs> uh, these are just skins for uh, the next series of Sound Suits 2.0. Uh, but you're only just seeing a little part of that. But remember, these will be shrouded in blackness. So you will not see what you see behind me in the finished product. It will, it will pierce its way through in the background, but it will not be on the surface. 
So when all of the sequins are hand sewn, how long does it take you? Hand sewn with my amazing staff of artists that I work with. Uh, you know, it, you know, one piece will take us, you know, from, from uh, beginning to finish a month working with three people. Sounds good. That that's gonna be awesome. I can't wait to see the finished product on that one. It's it's absolutely beautiful. So as we sort of look at where we are right now in our world and our country, I know that we all are looking for something to provide us with a space of healing and peace and um, just inspiration. So what does it mean to be an artist in this moment in history and culture? For me, it's uh, crucial. It's, uh, you know, I'm sort of, you know, I think with, with the George Floyd incident, I sort of, it made me stop and get quiet because I was confused, like all of this work that I'm doing and I felt that it had no purpose in that moment. And so I started to think about like, you know, how can I become more purposeful? You know, what do I need to do to become more purposeful? And so then that led me to think about like my gallery in New York, as I started to do research on the gallery and I started to look at their, uh, artist pool and realize that they represent, you know, 70% artists of color. And I started to sort of like question, where is their purpose? And so it just like fucking like had me like, everybody's going to be responsible. And I need you to sort of ask these questions to yourself, for yourself. And so I just sort of like, really started to sort of sort of take this higher kind of road and uh, am really sort of being as proactive as I possibly can in this sort of moment. It's a lot for us all to take on right now, like COVID and what's going on in DC and racism is a lot. It's a lot. And, you know, in isolation and teaching online and just trying to do all of these things and yet have a studio practice. So for me, it's really just sort of uh, thinking more about actions. What actions can take place right now? How can I sort of mobilize? What are things that I can do to sort of uh, through uh, exercises, through projects that unify and bring us together? It's really about bringing us together and doing whatever we can do, establishing any sort of projects or uh, or relationships that you can work with, organizations that you can partner with that can help uh, move us forward. That's all that we can do. And we all can get involved in, in many different things uh, around this sort of cause. I can't imagine that this is the world that we want to live in. Uh, and it's not my world. And so I will continue to move forward with what I see my world to be in spite of everything else that's going on. I think that we're all in, in that sort of space at this time in, in history and in our country that we all feel that, you know, we're in the process of sort of reevaluating what we do and how we do it. And, um, something has to change and, and we can all be a really active part of, of that change in the work that we do. So I'd just like to ask you, um, 
in reimagining where we are in this world at this time and how art plays a major role in, in the museum world, I know that at the Comer we've had to reimagine what we do and how we do it. Um, we've sort of been forced into this virtual world, which is comes with um, uh, just a lot of work, but very it allows us to be able to reach out to more people. It, it allowed us to connect with you and many people across the country, which is sort of a blessing to be able to allow us to have great conversation with others. So what type of narrative do you see for the future of museums and institutions around the country? Well, I think, you know, it's interesting how we have to, you know, we're all in this, in this reimagined sort of space. Uh, but I think the museums, uh, the institutions, uh, you know, the slate is clean now. What do, what do you want that to look like? You know, how do we design exhibitions that will, that may have to sort of be sort of designed where it sort of is about flow and movement uh, and choreography in, in a sense. How do we, uh, so I think until we're sort of out of this sort of uh, COVID period, we have to think about uh, the institutions in that way. But I think also, how do we conduct uh, virtual exhibitions? How do we uh, create virtual workshops? How do we, you know, what is, what are you reaching out into the community for? Why? What is the why? And what do you anticipate getting back from that? So it's really, you know, I think it's all about service right now. How do we become more of service to the community? Uh, and right now we have this virtual platform. So the accessibility is greater. Uh, the reach is broader. Um, but I think it really is, it comes down to like, you know, what do we, how do we see ourselves? You know, how do we want to move forward as an institution? What are our goals and how do we start to now really start implementing these, this new way of thinking and existing? How do we become more inclusive? Uh, and really starting to design and really starting to sort of re sort of identify the mission of the institution. So how do you think we can become more inclusive as museums and institutions? I think it's really about, again, this accessibility, like how do you get into the underserved communities? You know, how are you, what are, what are you putting in place in order for these sort of actions to take place? Uh, how do we reach those that need to be reached? Uh, you know, it's like when I'm working on projects, it's like, you know, I'm like feet on the ground, sleeves pulled up. I need to know who lives here. And so that means I need to get out and scouts and sort of seek out the world in which I have chosen to take on a sort of uh, title or uh, to be a leader. And, and what does that sort of mean to you, to anyone? You know, what does it mean to be a leader? And how do you lead by example? And so for me, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's like, you know, when I think about like amends, this project, well, you know, I can sort of talk about all that I want to do and, and be mad and angry, but I can also be a leader and be a force to be reckoned with in this time of need. Uh, 
And so, you know, I can't wait for anyone. I can make things happen. So I think that, you know, I think, you know, I'm a dreamer, you know, I uh, have always been, I'm a visionary. And so I don't think, you know, noun is the present, but I'm sort of projecting what the future can look like. So I, I think too, I think, you know, these in the positions of power can also help uh, come up with strategies of what, what, you know, what is that, you know, how are we moving our institution forward? What's the plan? What's the plan? Right now we're in this sort of time where, you know, again, reimagining the plan so that when the doors reopen, it's a new, so. It definitely is a new and, and it's an amazing time to be able to make change. Uh, in some instances, we have sort of been forced to make change, but change that is actually very much needed. So I appreciate that. So it, your work is so inspiring. I mean, I, you know, it just, um, just being able to have a conversation about some of the issues that are current in our world right now and how it relates to art and how it allows people to be able to express themselves and to be inspired um, in such a challenging time that we're all in right now. So for our audience this evening, can you share any words of inspiration uh, for those who are looking for their own purpose? I know you talked about purpose and how your art has really sort of given you purpose and uh, direction. What can you share with others on the call tonight about finding their own purpose? Well, I think we have to ask ourselves, you know, again, you know, what is the world that we want to live in? And just sit with that question for a minute. I think we have to sit in silence. You know, it's, I sit in silence every night for an hour. And just that just brings a lot of clarity into your life. But just asking ourselves, is this the world in which we want to exist in? And if it's not, then come out of the house, participate, be a part of some movement, uh, ask yourself, how do I want to be responsible? You know, what is my civic duty in this moment? Uh, and uh, take action. That's great advice. Absolutely great advice. I think we've got time for a couple of questions. I've, I've been seeing several questions come through uh, with, with almost 300 people on the call. We can take a few questions. Um, what does community, from, from Mallory Tay, what does community and village mean to you? Well, community, uh, you know, I think about like Mass Mocha and, uh, you know, this project has traveled the world. It's been in Australia, it's been uh, in Scotland, uh, and now it's at the moment here in Arkansas. And so that project is a installation, a kinetic installation, but it also is a community outreach project. So there's an entire other program that supports the project where we're working in community. We've invited about 30 local artists to do a call and response to UNTIL. So they will then be doing these virtual uh, readings, uh, dance, spoken word, uh, 
fashion shows, uh, writings, vocals will all be intervening with that project. Uh, the project is a convening space for people to come and have these conversations. Um, the project is for everyone. And so, you know, I personally do work that is for the world. Uh, you know, again, I, you know, I have been given, given an assignment and so I then deliver it. And then for me, I just walk away because the project has to do the work. Uh, and so community is everything at the end of the day. Um, so another question, uh, what are some other, who are some other creatives who bring you joy? Mm, I don't bring, you know, I think, you know, living life brings me joy. Uh, teaching brings me joy. Uh, there's, you know, I think in terms of artists, I think Kiefer is probably the artist that emotionally brings me, well, it's, it's joy, but it's like hard, but it's, joy because my he has always uh, congregated up my emotions. I think when I was sort of 18, I saw a painting and I started to cry, which I didn't even know art could make you cry. And so that just sort of changed everything for me. But you know, I'm looking at a lot of things. I'm looking at you know, I'm looking, you know, I, I had Spear, the graduate program at uh, the School of the Art Institute here in Chicago in the fashion program. And so, you know, I'm looking at the sort of collections and how the designers are now showing their collections through virtual platforms. And so I'm looking at all of these sort of these new ways of thinking about presentation. Uh, and so that's intriguing. And just thinking about like all of, we've got to think of new ways of putting work out in the world. Uh, and so that's, that's interesting to me. It's interesting to think about you know, the protest and thinking about, you know, all these buildings in Chicago that are being boarded up, but then that are also being covered in artwork. So I'm just sort of like, so it's, it's, it's so many sort of intersections that are happening all at the same time. Uh, because the state of the world in which we live in right now. So I'm, I'm full of joy that I can be actively involved in participating in all of it. That's great, that's great. Well, we're about to get to the end of our evening. Uh, I know we can sit and talk all night long. This is such an inspirational conversation and certainly learning more about the work that you do and hopefully inspiring all of us on the call to look within and find our purpose and how we can connect with our own communities. Um, so this has been a great conversation. Uh, before we close up, are there any other words that you'd like to share with our audience this evening? No. <laughs> No, this has been great and I really appreciate your time and uh, uh, I'm glad we could have this conversation. Thank you so much. Well, it has been amazing getting to know you and having a conversation with you. And it's been amazing to have our intimate conversation with 300 people, which is very intimate. So 
I really enjoyed that. So I just want to, again, thank you for taking time to share your story with us and uh, to help us get a better understanding of your work and how we can all play a major role in really just creating change and purpose, not only in our lives, but in the community in which we live. Um, for all of you on the call tonight, I wanna let you know that uh, you can purchase some Nick Cave products at our retail shop at the Comer Museum. So uh, please feel free to go on our website. We've got our, use our Venmo at Comer Museum and uh, purchase some of those wonderful Nick Cave products that we have at our retail store. And of course, lastly, I'd like to give another big thank you to our very generous sponsors for this evening, Matt and Ashley Woditz, for making this evening possible. And also, if you're interested in any more of these virtual programs, please visit the Cummer Museum website at cummermuseum.org or follow us on our social media. We are always looking for ways to connect and engage uh, our community. So we appreciate any uh, ideas or any response. I know that we weren't able to get to everyone's questions this evening, but we will follow up with you. And um, we again, thank you all for joining us tonight on Culture and Conversation. And I hope you all have an amazing night. Good night, everyone. Bye. Good night. Thank you.